Hey guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome to another beginner's guide to Dart tutorial video. Today we're going to be talking about scope and we're also going to be looking at collections and iterables inside of Dart. This will also include some functional programming concepts. Now I was going to move on to some more advanced topics, but then I realized that I hadn't covered scope, even though it's a pretty important concept. So let's take a look at it first. Let's consider this example for a second. I have a variable here called x and I'm printing out x. Then I've got a function declared here and it's declared globally and I'm trying to print out x. Now notice I do not have access to x inside of this print statement and in fact I get back an error that says that x is undefined. This is in essence the scoping inside of Dart. Dart as a language has what's called lexical scoping. This means that the variables that you define inside of a block are scoped to that block. So I've defined the variable x inside of the main function, and so the variable x exists from this curly bracket to this curly bracket. And it will also exist in any curly brackets that exist inside of these original curly brackets. So for instance, if I have an anonymous function, I can still access the x variable because it's inside of these brackets. And of course, we can pass variables from one scope to another by using, for instance, parameters. So here I've added a parameter to the printx function that takes in an integer x. So now I can go ahead and take this x and then pass it into printx and we can now call printx. And what this is really doing is it's passing a reference to this value x so that then this function can essentially call this variable or a copy of this variable and then print it out. Once you have a handle over scopes inside of Dart, the idea is pretty intuitive. Just remember that when you declare a variable inside of a block of code, it's scoped to that block of code and to any blocks of code that are inside of that block of code. In other words, it's only visible to any of the blocks that are inside of that larger block. Now let's take a look at collections. So thus far we've taken a look at the list collection and the map collection. At least we showed that they were primitive types inside of Dart. Lists are just collections of values and they can be collections of multiple different types as we saw in one of the earlier videos. But generally you want to have lists with consistent types. So for instance, in this example, we have a list of integers called x, where we're adding four different values to this list. Now remember, collections in Dart are zeroth indexed, which means that the first element in the collection has an index of zero. So it goes zero, one, two, and then three and then we can access this one value by calling x and then using square brackets like this and then putting in the zeroth index. If we want to enumerate over each of these individual values, we can use a for loop and we can use the in keyword as syntactic sugar for this. So if you have a collection of values, and this could be a list, a map, a set, or a queue, or any other kind of collection, you can use for in in this way where you're essentially saying, all right, for each of the individual values inside of the collection, take those values and assign them to the i variable in this case, and then for each iteration, move up a number in the collection. So this will assign one to i, then it will print out i, then it'll move up another loop, it'll assign two to i, print out two, and then it'll move up to three and assign that to i and then print it out, and then it'll move up to four, assign that to i and then print it out before the loop will actually just stop looping. So instead of having to create an entire for loop like this, where we create a value i, and then we specify a conditional where i must be less than x's length, and then i gets incremented for each of the loops through the for loop, we can just say the integer i is inside of the collection x, and then we can iterate through the entire collection. And of course, if we run this code, we get one, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, four, because both of the loops are exactly the same. 
Now the interesting thing about collection classes in Dart is that they inherit from a abstract class called iterable. At least the list and queue classes do. The set class inherits from a class called iterable base, and this is yet another abstract class. And then the map class is also abstract itself, and it forms a root for a bunch of series of classes that implement containers of values associated with keys. The iterable interface allows you to enumerate or iterate, that is read over the entire collection one item at a time without mutating that collection. And this is what's called an iterator. We can of course directly access the iterable class and use its constructors. So for instance, I'm calling iterable.generate then I'm passing in how many items I want to generate, and then I'm passing in an anonymous function which will be used to generate this iterable. Down here I have our for loop which will then go through each of the items in the iterable and then print them out for us. As you can see here, the iterable that was generated is an iterable where the values are between 0 and 9. We can convert iterables into lists, we can convert them into sets, and we can also convert them into a string. So if I go ahead and run this application now, you can see here, this is the list version, and we have the set version, and then we have our string representation. The interesting thing about iterables is that when you call a for in loop on a normal collection like a list or a set or even a map, you're actually generating an iterable. And as you can see, we can generate an iterable, and it's very easy for us to then turn that iterable back into a normal type of list, and vice versa. The iterable itself exists to protect the collection while we're iterating over it. So if we were to spawn multiple iterators on one single collection, then we would be spawning multiple instances of that iterable. And when we go and we use these transformation methods on the iterable, we create new collections rather than mutating the old one. If we want to iterate through an iterable or a collection even easier than just using a for loop like this, we can use the for each method. The for each method takes in an anonymous function and then it executes that anonymous function for each of the items inside of the collection type. So here I've got the numbers iterable, and then I'm calling for each, and I'm passing in an anonymous function that takes in one integer or one dynamic value, and then it just prints out that dynamic value. First we have zero, so we'll print out zero, then we have one, then we'll print out one, and it'll do this all the way up to nine. And as you can see here, it looks exactly like with our for loop, where it's just printing out zero all the way up to nine. For each is very useful when you don't actually need the index of the item inside of the collection. All collections inside of Dart also have getters for the first value and for the last value. So we can just call numbers.first and this will give us the zero, which is the first value in our iterable. And then we can also call numbers.last, which will give us the nine inside of our iterable. Now let's say we want to skip the first four values inside of our iterable. We also have a method for that called skip. And so we can call numbers.skip pass in the value of four, so this will skip zero all the way to three, and then it will create a new list without those first four values inside of it. So as you can see here, we have our first value, which is zero, then our last value, which is nine, and then we have a new list without the first four values, which is zero through three, and it's just four through nine. Now I've increased the size of the iterable that we're generating to 100, and say I still want to get the values from 0 to 9, I can use the take while method to do this. This takes in a anonymous function, and the anonymous function returns a boolean value, and essentially what it does is it will take the values until the conditional returns false. When n is less than 10, return true, but once n is not less than 10 anymore, return false. And as you can see here, we get back zero through nine. 
The values that are being passed through this take while function are considered lazy. This means that they do not exist until they're evaluated. So in theory, we could call take while on an infinite iterable, and it will not actually slow down the computation time because we're only using 10 of those values with this particular function. Also keep in mind that when you use take while, as soon as we get back false, the iteration stops. For instance, if we want to try and get back all of the even values, and we use n mod 2 to do this, then this will only return the first even value, and then it will automatically stop executing. These take and take while functions do the opposite of the skip function, and in fact there's also a skip while function. Now let's say I want to look through our collection and see if any of the values in the collection fulfills a conditional. Here I'm just checking to see if any of the values in our iterable are even, and if one of them is, then it will return back true. Now we can check every single value in the iterable to see if it satisfies a conditional. So rather than using any, where we're basically checking to see if at least one of the values matches the conditional, with every we're saying, all right, well, all of them need to match the conditional for it to return a Boolean of true. Now say we actually want to get back all of the even values inside of our iterable and then put them into a new list. We can use the where method for this. So again, we just need to pass in an anonymous function where a boolean is returned back if the value meets a conditional, and then if it does meet that conditional, then we collect those values. For those of you who are familiar with functional programming, generally this function is called filter, but in Dart it's called the where function. So as you can see here, we get zero all the way up to 98, where all of the values in between are even. Now say we want to apply a function to every item, and then form a new list from the results of doing that. We can use what's called the map function. So here I'm calling our iterable, and I'm taking the first 10 items in the iterable. Then I'm calling the map method on it, and I'm passing in an anonymous function that takes each of the values and then multiplies that value by two. And then of course I'm calling to list to convert it into a new list. As you can see here, we get zero, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, and 18, because these are the numbers zero through nine multiplied by two. The map function is extremely useful, and I highly recommend using it when you come to problems where you need to deal with large collections of data. Now let's say we want to take all of the items in our collection or our iterable, and we want to add them together. We can go ahead and do this with a for loop by creating a value with zero to start, and then iterating through our iterable. And what we're doing is we're taking each of the values from the numbers iterable, and we're taking our sum, and then we're adding that value to the sum using this plus equals syntactic sugar symbol. This is just shorthand for this, where we're just saying sum equals sum plus x. And then after we've iterated through our iterable, we can then just print out the entire sum. And as you can see here, the sum of all the numbers from zero all the way up to 99 is 4,950. From a functional standpoint, we can accomplish this using the reduce method. The reduce method takes in an anonymous function that has two parameters rather than one. The two parameters are a previous value and then the number that we're iterating through. So the previous value is sort of like this sum variable. And then all we're doing is we're saying, all right, iterate through our iterable and then add our items to this previous value. And of course, predictably, we get the same value for both of the calls. Now let's say we want to get back the smallest number in our list as well as the largest number in our list. We can use our math library to bring in a function called min and a function called max. And then we can use it in conjunction 
with the reduce method. As you can see here, we get back 0 and then 999 respectively. And of course, it doesn't really matter what the order of our list is. Now just keep in mind, guys, that the most powerful functions on our iterable or our collection type are the reduce map and where functions, where the where function is essentially the filter function. Using these functions can essentially allow you to recreate all of the other methods which are also attached to the iterable abstract class. Now I mentioned before that the map type, the map collection type is a bit different than most of the other collection types inside of Dart. And this is mainly because the map type is an associative data type, which means that it has two values where each of the values are associated with one another. So we have a key and then we have a value and then we have another key and then another value. In this case, we're creating a map from an iterable. So we're just grabbing our iterable here of zero all the way up to 999. And then we're creating a new map using the map from iterable constructor. And we're just taking the first 10 values from our iterable. So we'll just take zero to nine. And then what this will do is it will put in zero for the key and then zero for the value, and then one for the key and one for the value, and so on and so forth. Then down here, map also has its own map function, but the difference here is that the anonymous function that we pass into the map function needs to return what's called a map entry object, and the map entry object has the key and then the value as the second value of the map entry. So what we're doing here is we're mapping over our map to create a new map. We take the key, which is an integer, and then the value, which is also an integer, and then we just pass in the key for the key of the new maps map entry, and then we add the key and value together for the new value of the next map that we're creating. And here's what our new map looks like. The first key is zero, then the first value is zero. The second key is one, and then the second value is two. And this goes all the way up to nine and 18. All right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you dislike this video, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. Have a good night.